Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Kaufman from Pollinator Partnership. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for the first of five workshops in the Pollinator and Habitat Technical Training Workshop Series. We would like to invite all of you to actively participate in today's workshop by submitting questions for each of the presenters through the Q&A function, which can be found either on the bottom or right-hand corner of your screen. Questions can be entered during and after each of the presentations. And with that, I'm honored to introduce our first speaker. Edward Spivak. Ed has dedicated the last 42 years of his career to the conservation of invertebrates and vertebrates. He's the curator of invertebrates at the St. Louis Zoo and is the director of the Wild Care Institute Center for Native Pollinator Conservation, or CNPC. Ed and the St. Louis Zoo helped establish the IUCN SCC Bumblebee Specialist Group. Ed also helped estab establish and continues to serve on the steering committees for the Honeybee Health Coalition, Farmers for Monarchs, and the Missourians for Monarchs Collaborative. He is also a member of the Science Advisory Council of Field to Market, which looks at biodiversity issues in the sustainable agriculture chain. Through the CMPC, Ed developed a food up program called Native Foods, Native Peoples, Native Pollinators, which is focused on food security, food sovereignty, and pollinator conservation on Native American reservations. And with that, please welcome Dr. Spivak. Hi, I'm Ed Spivak curator of invertebrates at the St. Louis Zoo and director for the Center for Native Pollinator Conservation. I'd like to talk to you today about native bees, their importance and diversity, their habitat needs, and their life histories. All right, I would first like to start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the St. Louis Zoo is located in the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Osage Nation and the Atlantic Confederacy. We also acknowledge that this area and parts of Missouri have been traditionally used by others, including the Pawnee, Sac and Fox, Dakota, Nakota, Oto, Missouri, Omaha, Iowa, Quapaw, Chickasaw, Kickapoo, and the Haudenosaunee. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people in this land before us. It familiarizes visitors with the cultures and histories of Missouri's indigenous tribes, as well as with their ties in the St. Louis region. We honor our heritage of native peoples and what they teach us about stewardship of the earth. So pollinators, around 90% of flowering plants it's about 400,000 species, depend to some extent on animal pollination. Some of those animals are wasps, beetles, moths, butterflies, flies, birds, bats, and bees. However, bees as a group are the most important group of pollinators for a couple of reasons. One is that they actively collect, collect and transport pollen. Other animals have, a have pollen sort of stuck on them by the plants or because of their hair, it gets caught in their hair. But bees are actually collecting pollen because that is what they're feeding their offspring. It is the vitamins, the lipids and fats, the nutrients that they raise their offspring on. They also show it's called flower constancy, which means that if a bumblebee, for example, is going on to a goldenrod flower, go to a goldenrod flower. If it's going on aster, go on aster to aster. So by doing so, it improves pollination for the plant. <clears throat> and it, we'll see in a moment, there's some bees which require only particular types of pollen and or nectar to raise their young. From a human point of view, 75% of our crop species worldwide require pollinators, most of those being bees. Over $29 billion of our crops in the US depend on honeybees and native bees. And I say over 29 billion because there is the value, for example, of a tomato from pollination. But if we now expand the value of that tomato to you know, marinara sauces, you know, putting on a hamburger, ketchup, we vastly expand the value of that $29 billion. Worldwide, we're talking about $577 billion. And from an individual point of view, about one out of every three mouthfuls of food and drink you, can, you take depends on pollinators. Now why three quarters of our crops, but only one third of our diet? That's because a good portion of our diet is made up of wind pollinated plants like corn, rice, wheat, barley, and oats. You could live on that, but not very healthily. So if you care about flavor, you care about color, you care about nutrition, then you start caring about the pollinators and particularly the bees. 
There are a lot of different crops that are pollinated by bees. Some are completely dependent on them, such as almonds. Some, though they may be wind or self-pollinated like coffee, you can increase overall yields by including bees in that process. So there are a lot of crops which benefit either completely or are enhanced by pollination by bees. Here in the United States, the economic value of native bees is estimated to be around $9.1 billion per year. So this is just the native bees, not the honeybees that people tend to think about mostly. And when we think about crops, oftentimes we think about foods where we may not see the bee actually pollinating it. But when you look at something like a strawberry, which can self-pollinate, it's not all that great looking or flavorful if it just self-pollinates. If you include a little bit of wind in the process, you get something which sort of looks like a strawberry, but it's certainly not marketable, doesn't really taste very good, not very nutritious. But if you include something like this small carpenter bee, then you get something which is flavorful, healthy, economically valuable. You get a good crop. Now, honeybees are used a lot in commercial pollination services. But I want to emphasize that native bees are a major portion of this. So for example, here with apples, you can pollinate uh, apples with honeybees. It's on average about uh, one to two and a half hives per acre. And you get a good crop, you get you know, a nice apple. But if you utilize native bees, and you can see the diversity of native bees here from digger bees to two-spotted bumblebees to blue orchard mason bee to small carpenter bee, Notice how each of these bees are a little bit different in size. They work the flower a little bit differently. And by so doing, you actually increase the overall fruit set, um, fruit production and seed set. So you actually create more crops by having that diversity of bees. There are other values of native bees too. They're active earlier in the season of the day. Um, many species are active even before the sun rises. Um, I've seen bumblebees around when there's a little bit of rain or even when there's some snow on the ground. Uh, just like honeybees, they collect both pollen and nectar. Unlike honeybees, there's no rental fees or the care of maintaining them. And they can also supplement honeybees um, if they're hard to acquire too. Remember, it's also not just about us. So a lot of animals depend upon bee pollination. So whether the fruits produced by bee pollination for mammals from black bears to grizzlies to ground squirrels to the fruits and seeds that birds eat, or even the ground strawberries for box turtles. All of these depend upon the services of pollination, mostly by bees. But when we talk about bees, this is what we tend to think about, the honeybee. The honeybee, and we'll talk about it again, is not native to the United States. And it's actually kind of an oddity. Um, in its social structure um, and its activity. When we look at bees, there are over 20,000 species worldwide. We have over 4,000 species here in North America. There's more bee diversity than there is in these larger taxonomic groups like amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. They range in size from here, the smallest one in North America, Perdita minima, no common name, to the face of a large carpenter bee. So they vary in size. So as I mentioned before, they're gonna work the flowers a little bit differently too. So I want you to come away with this talk that it's really about bee diversity, not bee abundance. When we're talking about everything from habitat and habitat restoration to crop production, agriculture, it's really about bee diversity. But what is a bee? Well, first off, it's an insect. It's made of three body parts, head, Abdom, thorax, and abdomen. But what really makes them unique is that they're hairy. So that hair on their body is really designed to collect pollen. They have various pollen collecting structures on their bodies. We'll mention that in a second. They've got long tongues to reach the uh, nectaries of various flowers. And think of them as vegetarian wasps. So whereas wasps are feeding their kids meat from either our barbecue or other insects, bees are feeding their kids pollen. They also show a variety of social behaviors from mostly solitary, which most bees are, to social, such as the honeybees and the bumblebees. As I said, one of the distinguishing characteristics besides being hairy is that they have structures for collecting pollen. So on a number of groups like this uh, 
longhorn sunflower bee. They have very long hairs on their hind legs to collect the pollen. One group, the megachylids, the leaf cutters and masons, have hairs on the underside of their abdomen for collecting pollen. And then the honeybees and bumblebees have a space on their hind legs called a pollen basket or corbicula, where it's a little concavity where they mix the pollen with a little bit of honey and pack it in as a little, uh, the pollen mix with a little bit of nectar and pack it in on their hind legs. So when we start thinking about pollen, and as I mentioned before, certain bees are going for different types of pollen. There are three words that you should be familiar with in the feeding strategies. There's polylectic, meaning the bees exhibit a broad, wide preference for pollen and nectar. Oligolectic, bees exhibit a narrow, specialized preference for pollen, sometimes just single family or genus. And then monolectic, which could be just a particular species of flowering plant. So to give you an example, here in Missouri, we've got 30 families of plants which host oligolectic bees. So these are bees which are only feeding on these particular types. There's at least 142 species that are oligolectic at some level, and then 21 species which are oligolectic on conservative plant tax, which means those plants which are endangered or threatened so that if those plants disappear, those bees also disappear. To give a little bit broader perspective, so here in Missouri, Asteraceae are the asters, sunflowers and their relatives, Fabaceae are beans, Salicaceae are the willows. So when we look at some of the bees here in Missouri, we've got almost 60 species which are just feeding on asters and their relatives. Almost 10 species which are just feeding on beans and almost 10 species which are just feeding on willows. So these are very specialized so that if you do not have those plants, you will not be supporting those bees. Some examples of these uh, oligolectic bees, southeastern blueberry bee, 90 to 95% of its diet is just blueberries. The other 5% to 10% is redbud. Squash bees, which are specialist on cucurbits. Hibiscus bee on hibiscus and their relatives, like even the exotic Rose of Sharon. Sweet potato vine bee, which feeds on, uh, collects pollen and nectar from morning glory and sweet potato vines. And the sunflower bee, which collects pollen and nectar from sunflowers and their relatives. So along with the specialization on food types, different bees can only travel so far, and a lot of that is based upon size. So honeybees can travel on average one to two miles, upwards of seven to eight. Bumblebees also average about the same, but then will also go up to eight miles. But some of the smaller bees may only go about 300 feet um, or maybe even less than that, depending upon their size. Uh, the studies shown on the right, those are different uh, species of bees, Heriades or resin bee, Chalostoma, a type of mason bee, Osmia type of mason bee. So you can see that their flight distances aren't very far. And this study came away with the general rule of thumb that if you're planting, you shouldn't have a space of more than about 150 meters between flower strips. Along with the specialization on the food, the pollen, and also the distance traveled, many bees are very seasonal. So there are a number of species that fly throughout the growing season. So this is also from uh, data here in Missouri. So Hylaeus, which are mask bees, Agaclora, Agaclorella, Halictus, Agapospin, Lysiglossum, or sweat bees, Ceratina, small carpenter bees, Bombus, bumblebees. You can find these bees flying from April through October. So a broad range of uh, pollen and nectar sources they'll be collecting. But when you look at say April and May, Osmia, the mason bees, they're only out during that time. So if there's nothing blooming during April and May, you're not going to be having those bees or supporting them. In the August and September, Melisodes, the longhorn bees, they're specialists on those summer blooming plants. So without those, you're not supporting. So there's a real strong seasonality among bees. The best example I like to give of seasonality, even though, as I said, you can find it throughout the year, are bumblebees. So right now, going into fall, uh, new queens which have emerged been feeding heavily on things like goldenrod, blazing stars and asters uh, to bulk up. Kind of think of like bears going into hibernation. Bumblebee queens do the same thing. 
So they've bred, they've put on fat reserves and energy reserves, and now they're going to hibernation. In the spring, when they emerge, they're going to be looking for those spring blooming plants. If there are none of those around, they will not be able to start their colonies. In the summer, of course, you need all those flowering plants in order to support the bees throughout the year. And then in the fall, again, when the new queens emerge, those late fall blooming plants to support those next generation of queens. Bumblebees only live for about a year. So you can see that spring and fall are incredibly important for supporting bumblebees. Nothing in the spring, you don't have colonies. Nothing in the fall, you don't have colonies for the next year. So it really gives you an idea of that seasonality. This just kind of gives you an idea of seasonality for other species. Uh, Osmia, Blue Orchard Mason Bee on the left, Megacala rotundata, the alfalfa leafcutter bee on the right, showing you at different times of the year. Uh, you have them nesting, you have the development of the young, and then you also have them overwintering. So only a very short amount of time we actually see them out and about. For bumblebees are producing a lot of offspring. Most of these bees we only see during that time when they emerge and they start nesting to produce the next generation, and then we do not see them again until next year. So along with food and distance um, and seasonality, we also need to look at the uh, nesting behavior of a lot of these bees. So we have two main groups of, or two main styles of nesting for our native bees and native bees in general. One is ground nesting. So about 70% or about 3,000 species in North America are ground nesting bees. So from above, when you find them, you'll see what looks like anthills, but there are no ants going in and out. Um, usually you find them in open areas. Um, in bare ground, occasionally you'll see them in turf or grass. These nests may be as deep as three feet. Um, often they may be a little bit shallower, but having an open area, these open ground uh, spaces are incredibly important for the nesting. We think about the flowers, but we often don't think about the other uh, portion of the reproductive cycle. So often when you look around, this is an example from a few years ago out at Lake St. Louis, not far outside of the city. This was an area next to a driveway. When you first look at it, you don't really see too much. You look a little closer and you start seeing all these holes scattered all over. This was an area about 30 by 30 feet or so. And there were hundreds of holes of this bee, the spring polyester bee. So the females were making the holes, the males were flying around looking for females to mate with. So everything is very active, but also very inoffensive too. So I was literally on my hands and knees, walking, you know, climbing, trying to take pictures. The bees could have cared less um, about me. All they cared about was setting things up for the next generation. And we started looking at some of these nests. They really vary depending upon the species. Some can be just a a simple straight tube and just one um, chamber with a little bit of pollen and nectar for bee bread and one offspring. Some could have several chambers, um, you know, going off at different angles. So it really varies depending upon the bee, how elaborate these underground nests might be. Some examples of some of our ground nesting bees, breast and green metallic sweat bee, hibiscus bee, squash bee, mining bee, and sunflower bee. The other main group of nesting bees are the twig and tunnel nesting bees. So about 30% of our native bees are twig and tunnel nesters. Historically, they would have nested any hollow stems or beetle burrow uh, or holes. Uh, the nice part is because of that, we can encourage them to nest in a variety of areas. Um, so we can actually create nesting sites for these types of bees. They will also utilize cut stems. This is a leafcutter bee utilizing the cut stem of an elderberry. So she spent two days lining that nest with leaf material and setting in some pollen and nectar and her eggs to set it up for the next generation. Some will use vertical stems like this little small carpenter bee where they'll uh, burrow into the pithy stem of the center of the plant in order to also set up their offspring for the next generation. They will often use any holes that they can find. So this isn't a concrete wall. This was a leaf cutter bee that I found looking out, utilizing that nest, or sometimes you'll just see bits of leaf material 
that they've used in order to line their nest with. Or you may be lucky enough to find them actually sealing up their nest. There's a leaf cutter bee using a bit of coreopsis uh, flower and a little bit of geranium leaf in order to seal up their nest. So if you were to look inside of one of these nests, you'd see a series of cells. And then depending upon the species, uh, like mason bees, they would be using mud in order to separate the individual uh, cells. Here you can see the pollen mass. They lay an egg on it. Um, with the leaf cutters, they'll make individual cocoons with the leaf material. So you'll see this whole series. And when we look at the ground nesting bees, th those individual cells will look very similar to this. Some examples of the uh, twig and tunnel nesting bees, uh, leaf cutter bee, carter bee, another leaf cutter bee, resin bee, and mason bee. You also may just see the activity of these bees. If you find leaves or flower petals with nice little holes cut out of them um, or nice edges, this is not beetle damage, this is not caterpillars. These are leaf cutter bees. And here you see a female slicing off a section that she's going to go and take and line her nest with. Or some, like the carter bee, is actually scraping the hairs off of leaves. This is on white sage. So this carter bee would scrape up the, the hair from the leaves, roll it up into a ball, and then take it back to her nest. So it looked like actually cotton that she was using to line her nest with. So the one issue that a lot of people have with bees is worried about stings. So <clears throat> easiest way I, I related to treat bees like you would treat people. So if you walked around amongst a bunch of people and started swinging your arm, somebody's going to hit you. You walk around amongst a bunch of bees, start swinging your arms, there's a chance someone could hit you. But when a bee is on a flower, just like when you're at dinner or lunch, all you're thinking about is eating and drinking, but you're not thinking about hurting anybody. Similar with a bee, all they're thinking about is eating and drinking, collecting pollen to raise you know, kids for the next generation. And some of the bees, like the andrenids, the mining and digger bees, their stingers are not even strong enough to go through human skin. So really don't worry too much about this issue. So now what I want to talk about is some of the diversity to give you an idea of what these bees are. So there are six main families we find here in the United States, the Andrenidae, the Calidae, Megachylidae, Elictids, and Apids. There's also the Melidids, uh, but they are so few in number, I'm not going to cover them. So I'm going to go briefly through each of these groups to give you an idea of what they are. So the Calidae, polyester, cellophane bees, and mask bees. They have a heart-shaped face. Uh, the Hylaeus, the mass bees, are very small, uh, very wasp-like. Uh, they are hairless. So as I said, many bees have structures on their body to collect pollen. They actually swallow the pollen and take it back to the nest. Uh, Calides, um, they tend to be hairy, gray to brown, pale abdomen. <clears throat> Both of them are solitary, but Calides will also nest in aggregations, like I showed you that ground nesting uh, assemblage a little bit ago. So this gives you an example of mask bees, where the males have this nice uh, yellow or white mask on their face, depending upon the species. Females will have just a couple of marks, and you can see how small these guys are. So this is on milkweed, which has very small florets in a larger compound flower. So it is a very small bee. And as I mentioned, these are called cellophane or polyester bees. And the reason they're called that is because they line their nests with this plastic-like material. So here you can see a mask bee. Uh, this hole, by the way, is only about an eighth inch in diameter. So it secretes this plastic to uh, keep the, the nest watertight, keep out fungus, and protect the developing young. Spring polyester bee, Calides inequalis, a very common bee often seen in the spring. And as I said, they're ground nesting bees. So you may often see them in aggregations on the ground. Mining or digger bees, and this is where we get into the problems with common names. Uh, you can find the Andrinidae listed as mining bees. You can see them listed as digger bees. Um, it is in reference to their life cycle, lifestyle, which they are ground nesters. So it does become confusing. Um, so I tend to just use Andrinids uh, because it does get confusing. Is it a mining bee? Is it a digger bee? Uh, many of them are uh, often spring bees, 
that's when you usually tend to find them. Uh, though there are species found throughout the year, uh, they are solitary, they nest in soil. Uh, some of them can be specialists on certain types of flowers too. And what characteristic of all of them is that they have what are called facial fovea, these depressions between their eyes and antenna which show which hold these short velvety hairs. So here you can see the face of an andrenid and you can see almost like vertical mustaches, kind of that area between the antenna and the eyes with these little hairs. It's very characteristic of this family. And once you get used to seeing them, you'll actually notice that more and more. Some of the species in this group, Andrena carlini, and this is where we get a, a problem. Many of them do not have common names. So we go by their scientific names. Andrena perplexa, Andrena aerogenea, which is a specialist on spring beauties, the plant that it's on. So if there are no spring beauties, you will not have this species. The leaf cutters, mason, carter, and resin bees, all one family, megachylidae, their common names are derived from the materials that they use to line their nests. As I mentioned before with the twig and tunnel nesting bees, um, some are using leaf materials, some are using mud, and that's what gives the common name. So leaf cutter bees are using leaf and flower petals. Mason bees using mud, sand, or small pebbles. Carter bees plant hairs. Resin bees plant resins. Uh, they are solitary, but they will often nest in aggregation. So if you create like a bee hotel, they don't mind nesting to each near each other. Uh, one characteristic of all of them is the hairs, as I mentioned before, on the bottoms of their abdomen. So they do not have hairs on their hind legs for collecting pollen. It's all on the underside of their abdomen. So it shows a leaf cutter and a mason bee, the long hairs and the pollen being collected. So some examples, Megacali mendica, a leaf cutter bee, Megacali anemica, blue orchard mason bee, Osmia lignaria, Osmia georgica, wool carter bee, Anthidium anacotum. This is actually a non-native species, though we do have native carter bees also. Resin bees, this is the small resin bee. I can get an idea of its size. This is bee balm or monarda. So this is a very small bee, but you can still see the pollen on the underside of its abdomen. Sweat bees, a fairly diverse group. Uh, some are small and brown or black. Um, some are, you know, metallic blues, coppers or green. So they come in really kind of three size color groups. So the medium size brown with or without stripes, often, you know, halictus. Small to medium, metallic greens, and then the very small ones, bronze, golden metallic to almost black. They have a very diverse social structures. Um, most of them are solitary, but some are kind of what are called semi-social, quasi-social, uh, not truly social like honeybees are or bumblebees. And some may nest in, uh, may have several generations. Most of them nest in the ground, but there are a few like Agachloropura, which nests in rotting or soft wood. So some examples, the breast and green metallic sweat bee, silky striped sweat bee, Echophosmon cerisius, Electus legatus, often called the furrow bee, Lazy glossum, the small sweat bees, Agachlora pura. And then the one very diverse group, um, which at one time had been split up into a number of families of the apidae, so the ones I'm going to talk about today are the carpenter bees, bumblebees, bees, honeybees, longhorn bees, and the cuckoo bees. So large carpenter bee, here in the east, we only have one species when you go out west. There are several species in some parts of the world. Uh, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, there are some 121 species of large carpenter bee. They tend to be large, very stocky. Um, our eastern carpenter bee looks very much like a bumblebee, um, black abdomen and you know, buff or yellowish thorax. The adults often overwinter in groups. The males are stingless. They're the ones which patrol territories uh, for nesting areas for the females um, or for uh, pollen resources for the females. They're the ones that make also those nice uh, chambers to raise their young in. Whereas the other twig and tunnel nesting bees, they're using pre-existing holes the large carpenter bees are using, are, are chewing through themselves and make these beautiful holes in wood to raise their young. Uh, here you can see a female starting its nest 
So it's the males who are hovering around protecting territories. Uh, they have much larger eyes than the female uh, for seeing the females. You can also tell the difference between males and females. Females have a black face, whereas males have this cream or yellow mustache. There are also the small carpenter bees, very closely related to large carpenter bees, but much smaller. They're metallic blue green in color. Um, they also have pollen carrying hairs on their hind legs. They are solitary, occasionally subsocial. Uh, these will nest usually in dead twigs and stems. Very small bee. So here's an example. This is on a flower called a Rigeron, which is about the size of a dime to give you an idea of size. Um, but just like the large carpenter bee, you can tell the difference between males and females. Looking at their face, males have an inverted T, whereas the females only have a little you know, dash on their face. And I wanted to show this picture because people often confuse the large carpenter bees with the bumblebees. Easiest way to tell the difference is looking at their butt. Shiny butt, large carpenter bee, hairy butt, bumblebee. So the bumblebees, robust hairy bees, a variety of colors, black body covered with black hair, yellow, brownish or orange hair bands. In some parts of the country, there's also some white. Uh, they are truly social uh, species. They often nest in pre-existing cavities and landscape with rock piles, rodent burrows, layers of dense vegetation. There are a whole number of species. We have some 50 different species here in North America. A few examples, eastern bumblebee, brown-belted bumblebee, and all these can be told usually by looking at the patterns of the hairs on their body. Black and yellow bumblebee, American bumblebee, and two-spotted bumblebee. And when you look inside a colony, they're truly social, but unlike the honeybees, they don't have that nice hexagonal honeycomb structure. Uh, they have these little pots where they store their pollen and nectar and raise their young. And here you can also see the difference in size between a queen and some of the early workers. Honeybees, uh, also with a heart-shaped head, but they have hairy eyes compared to Kalides. Uh, they really range in color. They also are truly social. They also are not native, introduced around 1622 um, into the United States, a little bit earlier into Spanish Florida. They're the ones who have that characteristic hexagonal shape to their combs, uh, but that is unique to the honeybees and genus Apis. Usually very recognizable, but there's a lot of color variation. So here are three different color variants. So oftentimes people see something which is maybe like all golden or even all black and think it's something else besides a honeybee, but they're all honeybees. The longhorn bees, uh, which also includes the squash bees, uh, stout, robust body, uh, very hairy. The males have incredibly long antenna, which gives the uh, common name to these individuals. Uh, the females have very long hairs on their hind legs for collecting pollen. And many of the species are also specialists on certain types of flowers, particularly the asters and their relatives. So some examples, sunflower longhorn bee, you can see the male on the left with its long antennas and the female on the right with the long hairs on her hind legs. Ironweed longhorn bee, male on the left, female on the right. Two-spotted longhorn bee, male on the left, female on the right. This species compared to the last two is more Catholic in their taste, so they will collect pollen and nectar from a variety of different resources. They're also very easy to identify in the field when they're head first in the flower. You see these this black bee with these two white flashes on their abdomen. That's a two-spotted longhorn bee. Many of the longhorn bees will also, as males, uh, sleep together at night. So here's a nesting, a sleeping aggregation of two-spotted longhorn bee males on a bit of dead vegetation. Other members of the group, sunflower bee, uh, kind of a husky, robust, cute little bee, and the squash bee, uh, Melosotis pepinapus brunosa, which is a specialist on curcurbits, squashes and their relatives. And then we have the cuckoo bees. The cuckoo bees are actually determined by their life cycle. So you find them, many of them in the apidae, but there are other families which have uh, cuckoos as well. They tend to look more wasp-like. They will tend to have colors that look like warning colors of a wasp, reds, oranges, bold banding patterns. 
they are brooder nest parasites, so they will lay the egg, their eggs in the nests of other species. And it's estimated about 20% of bee species in North America are cuckoos. So some examples, Nomada, which are specialists on Andrina. Triapiolus concavus, which is a specialist on the uh, Sphastra, the uh, sunflower bee. And Celioxes, which is not an aphid, this is a megachylid. Uh, so this is a leaf cutter bee, cuckoo. As I said, you can find cuckoos in uh, pretty much all of the other families. And I just wanted to point out that there are some animals which look like bees, but kind of call them wannabes. So drone flies and serpent flies, because they're banding pattern, get the protection of looking like a bee or a wasp. Um, but they're not easy to identify these compared to a bee um, or a wasp. The large eyes often meeting in the center and very short antenna. Um, if you can look closely, you also see only two pair of wings. And then you have the wasps, usually a nice slender waist to them compared to the, um, the bees. And also they're not hairy too, so they're not collecting pollen on their bodies. And I finally I want to mention that native bees and other pollinators are in trouble for a variety of reasons. Loss of habitat, invasive plant species, change in agriculture, misuse of pesticides, disease and parasites, pollution, competition. Bumblebees are probably the best known in this paper from several years ago, looking at patterns of widespread decline in North American bumblebees, found a number of species which were disappearing. This led eventually to the establishment of the IUC and SS Bumble SSC Bumblebee Specialist Group, which is now broadened into the Wild Bee Specialist Group to look at the endangered status of all bees. Part of the job of the specialist groups are to identify whether a species is endangered or not. And through that is the IUCN red list. So here Franklin's bumblebee is listed as critically endangered, but it hasn't been seen since 2006 and is probably extinct. The rusty patch bumblebee is now listed on the US endangered species list. It's listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list. And here you can look at the image on the right. The gray is its former range. And really look at the green. This is where between the last few years, it has been spotted. So it used to occur across most of the Eastern US and now has disappeared across most of it. Similarly, the American bumblebee has now been petitioned to be listed as an endangered species. Look at those states that are red. Those are states where the bee has completely disappeared and shades of red to yellow showing where they've declined. So this species has also disappeared from a good part of its range. And one of the reasons for this, unfortunately, is agriculture, where we used to have very diverse agricultural areas. You'd have a lot of different crops, a lot of diversity in bees. But over time, when you start eliminating that diversity, creating huge monocrops, uh, this has also decreased the diversity for bees. A paper that came out in 2016 looking at overall bee abundance across the U.S. is this is bumblebees and all bees, where you see the lighter color, the yellow, this is where you have lower abundance, where species are declining. Here, to kind of give you an information related to pollination services. So these areas are areas where the bees are declining, but also where we're planting more pollinator-dependent plants. So there's unfortunately a disconnect between the number of bees we have and then unfortunately where we need them most, mostly. And this kind of shows you 139 counties at risk across the U.S. where they're declining. And then finally, with climate change, we're also seeing shifting in some of these species where they are going to disappear. This is just for bumblebees. So the reds and oranges are where bumblebees are going to be disappearing. The blues are where they're going to be possibly increasing. But you can see across a good portion of the U.S., we're going to lose a number of bumblebees. So what we need to do, we need to learn more about all these bees. But I think we need to really focus on the native bees because, as I said in the very beginning, it's really about bee diversity, not bee abundance. There are a number of good resources um, to help you identify. Through the St. Louis Zoo, we've got our, some bee identification and bumblebee uh, guides. Pollinator partnership. Bee Basics and the bumblebees of the eastern United States and western United States. Xerxes Attracting Native Pollinators, which was one of the first books that should go by the various genera of bees. The Bumblebees of North America, the Bees in Your Backyard, 
And then these two books by Heather Holmes on bees and identification native plant forage guide and pollinators of native plants. And with that, I thank you. Uh, if you have any additional questions, we're going to be finishing up with some, but you can always contact me at spivak at stlzoo.org for additional uh, questions. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Ed, for that fascinating and phenomenal presentation. Um, and with that, we'd like to invite you to come off mute and start your video so we can start the Q&A session. And while Ed is coming on, um, I would like to share with the rest of you, some folks have asked whether or not these uh, webinars will be recorded. Yes, they will be recorded and we will email you when they're up and posted. And for those of you that are having any difficulty with uh, the display on your screen, you should be able to make adjustments on your screen by dragging any divisions across so that you can see the full pre see the presentations full screen. So I should be on camera and off mute. So yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. All right. So we have some great questions coming in. Um, one of the first is, uh, what do the ole oleoglectic bees eat when their specific foods are not in bloom? And Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, I was going to say, the, the, the question continued is, is if, so if those bees, uh, sorry, I just lost the question here, um, and does the southeastern bee only forage when redbud or blueberries are in bloom and feed on honey the rest of the year? So when, for oligolectic bees, which are specialists on certain types of pollen and nectar, if those plants are not around, uh, those bees can't survive because particularly it's about the young. The young have evolved to feed only on particular types of pollen. So the adults are feeding on nectar and some of them may use nectar from a few other types of plants, but it's really for that next generation. That pollen, if they don't have that, you have very low survival rate or none at all. So it's really the pollen. So if those plants aren't around, you're not gonna have those plants, uh, not, you're not gonna have those bees. So it's really dependent on having that diversity. Um, the idea of honey, honey is only produced by honeybees. So it's really the nectar of plants. So even when we use examples of hibiscus bee, they're collecting pollen and nectar to raise their young. But I've also, particularly the males, you'll see them under the types of flowers. But for that next generation in particular, you need those plants. Thank you. Our next question um, is thinking about habitat restoration. What, what is a good metric of success in terms of the bee community? Uh, would you want a threshold native, uh, would you want a threshold native bee species richness? So it's really hard to say what the, the biggest uh, measure would be, what are your changes over time? So if you can get a measure of your bee diversity and abundance prior to restoration and then during, because different areas have different levels of diversity. For example, here in St. Louis, we've identified so far 205 species of bees just in the St. Louis area. So we are actually the most bee diverse city of any that have been surveyed so far anywhere in the world. So we're number one. Um, so you don't wanna base your uh, plantings that, oh, I want 200 species because they're gonna be dependent upon the flowers. If you can get some measures before and then during and constantly do it. We do this at home, uh, my wife and I. So we're just constantly looking at our plants. We just keep a tally of how many genera and how many species we see to keep it, get an idea. Same as you would do with birds or any other wildlife. That's an excellent point, the importance of monitoring. Um, next question, uh, does a small pollinator garden, a couple hundred square feet in an urban area, a couple of miles at least from any commercial agriculture or, or, or orchards really benefit pollinators? Uh, yes, actually every bit of planting. Uh, the nice part is you will plant it and bees will show up. Remember the the bees is not all about agriculture, it's about all those other native plants. So you may not have agriculture within a few miles, but there are gonna be other native plants. And certain bees, it's amazing how they'll find you. So for example, I plant squash. I have no idea where the nearest patch of squash are, but I get, you know, Pepinapis prunosa and Xenoglossus showing up, they find you. So if you plant it, it's gonna try it, but you know, they will come. And the more diversity you have, the better. Fantastic, thank you. 
Um, the next question, um, also about environmental indicators. What are good environmental indicators of healthy native bee populations? So there it gets back to um, doing some sort of you know, observation census. And this gets back to also how you identify bees. You know, traditionally, for bee researchers, you catch them. Unfortunately, you kill them or chill them down, put them under a microscope. But there are ways of actually identifying many of these bees without having to do that. Uh, bumblebees are a good example. Here in Missouri, we have 10 species which are readily um, identifiable just by eye. So if you start getting used to some of them or getting used to them by the genus, you can start identifying some of those bees in your area and also to be culturally sensitive. So for example, when we work with Native Americans, some of those will tell you outright, nope, we're not killing any bees. So coming up with other ways to, by observation, understanding what species you have and diversity. So it's really getting out into your garden, start looking at those bees, start seeing those characteristics, whether the facial fovea on the adrena um, or the coloration or the patterns of bumblebees, you can actually start getting a good idea of what the diversity is and how it's changing. Fantastic, thank you. Um, another question, uh, what are the top three actions that land managers and homeowners can take to provide high quality nesting areas for native bees? So for nesting areas, it's um, really two things. One, since 70% of our bees are ground nesting, have some bare ground. Uh, now you will have some of them nesting in some turf grass, but making sure you have areas which are uh, bare ground or undisturbed in particular. So if you are tilling soil, that is going to be disturbing to a lot of you know, those species. For twig and tunnel nesting bees, you can do it one of two ways. One, creating artificial nests, but others are leaving uh, old tree snags, um, cutting your vegetation to 18 to 24 inches. So many of those pithy stems, like things like goldenrod, they will bees will utilize those areas. Different types of trees and shrubs like elderberry, they will utilize those. And then of course, planting enough wildflowers to support those bees to raise their young so they can nest in those areas. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm gonna combine two questions here. Um, when are bees most vulnerable to low level non-lethal pesticide effects during their life cycle? Um, and another person had asked about the use of Roundup Ready coin and, corn and soybeans um, and wondering if that was a, a major cause of bee decline. So the, the idea of when they're most susceptible, it really kind of varies depending upon the, um, the pesticide. So if it is applied as a spray, the, the flight period, the adults are going to be more susceptible. If it is done as a drench, like a lot of systemic uh, pesticides like neonicotinoids, it's going to probably be more uh, susceptible to the offspring as well as also the adults too and gather nectar. So it's really gonna vary depending upon the type of uh, pesticide. So it, it's really trying to reduce that overall level. Um, and if you can get away without using any, that's always better. For the Roundup Ready, the biggest issue is not so much the corn and soy, but it's the use of Roundup, which then eliminates all the other flowers. So where you used to see, for me growing up, you'd see you know, wildflower borders around corn or soy, uh, but now with Roundup Ready, you can spray a lot of Roundup and you get rid of all those borders of wildflowers. So the biggest issue is actually the last, the, the elimination of other food resources for the bees, not so much the, uh, the chemical itself, the glyphosate, though there is work looking at whether the glyphosate or other chemicals that are part of it are affecting bees, but the biggest issue is that it just eliminates all the other wildflowers. Thank you. So we have time for one or two more questions. Um, we'll shine a little light on the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, Beth asked if rusty patch bumblebees are specialist pollinators, and if so, what plants do they need? So the rusty patch are not specialist pollinators, uh, but they, just like I mentioned before, just like a lot of bumblebees, they need spring, summer, and fall. Oftentimes when people think about planting gardens, they tend to think about just summer. 
So really think about those fall seasons. So spring, oftentimes it's usually trees and shrubs. People don't tend to think about that for wildflowers. And then in the fall, goldenrod, blazing star, um, asters are incredibly important. So really filling up the three seasons is really the most important part um, and having a broad diversity of flowers for those bees. So it's really the seasonal aspect, which is most important. They're not specialists on particular types of flowers. Yeah, so thank you. Um, last question. Can you talk about the advantage of partnerships and perhaps give an example of agencies or organizations you observe as advancing science and efforts for pollinator preservation? Uh, there's a lot of good ones. Uh, DAPSI, of course. I mean, it's, DAPSI is just, it's all partnerships. So when we look at even the, I co-chair the Imperial Bombas Task Force, we've got Fish and Wildlife, we've got universities, we've got different agencies, we've got the St. Louis Zoo as part of it. All of the groups that I belong to, like the Honeybee Health Coalition, Missourians for Monarchs, Farmers for Monarchs, which used to be the Keystone Monarch Collaborative, those are all broad coalitions. They are the growers, they are the ag businesses, they are the universities, they are the government agencies, they are the researchers, they are the citizen science groups, whether it be like master naturalists and master gardeners. All of these are working towards a common end. So like with Missourians uh, for Monarchs, everybody working together from state departments of transportation to state ag, to state fish and wildlife, to the universities, the zoo, and working. And weirdly enough, Missouri is kind of a, a leader in a lot of the habitat that we've prepared and also in our conservation plan for Monarchs. So, those are some examples showing that coalitions and getting people together are the most important way of getting conservation done. Absolutely, fantastic. Thank you again, Ed, so much for your wonderful presentation and for participating in the question and answer session. You're very um, welcome. And with that, um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, As long as I'm sharing my screen, here we go. Okay, sorry folks there. Okay, um, I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Anna Hess. Anna is the Deputy Director of the USGS Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center based out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Previously, she worked both for the Minnesota and Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Through these positions, she's conducted habitat management and research on the federally endangered Carner Blue Butterfly and other Lepidopterans. And his work has directly contributed to increasing Carner Blue populations in Wisconsin, generating suitable habitat in Minnesota, and to mapping the historic and current range of Carner Blues and their host plant across the United States and Canada. Her ongoing work continues to explore and document best management practices for the species. Please welcome Dr. Anna Hess. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Hess and I work for the U.S. Geological Survey as the Deputy Director of the Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center. Today I will be presenting USGS recovery initiatives for the monarch and carnivore blue butterflies. The monarch butterfly is a generalist species that ranges across North America to Northern South America, across the Caribbean, and as far away as New Zealand and Europe. The Eastern and Western populations are geog geographically separated, but have no genetic differences. Its host plant is any type of milkweed or Asclepias. The migration of the monarch across North and South America is divided between four generations. The first generation moves south to the pine reserves in Mexico and Florida. The second, third, and fourth generations fly north to northern locations in the United States and Canada. Unfortunately, the monarch butterfly population has declined dramatically over the last several decades. This is related directly to a reduction in milkweed. There has been more than a 40% decline in milkweed from 1998 to 2010, according to several well-documented studies. The milkweed decline in turn has been attributed to an increase in agriculture and the use of glyphosates. The glyphosates have also been attributed to a global decline of lepidopterans, more than 35% decline over the last 40 years. And keep in mind that that is lepidopterans, not other pollinating insects. 
The Monarch Conservation Science Partnership was formed in 2014 to develop a strategic habitat conservation plan for the further evaluation of the decline of monarchs and the associated host plant milkweed. This strategic habitat conservation plan is broken into four pieces. Biological planning, which is the goal setting portion of the plan, or how many monarchs do we want? Conservation design, which is developing spatially explicit models and identifying habitat objectives and priority areas. Conservation delivery, which focused heavily on land transformation and outcome based monitoring. What were the project or what were the project assumptions? Were they correct? And did the actions that we conducted achieve the intended results? To start with, the biological portion, the biological planning portion of the strategic plan looked at how many monarchs we need in order to maintain populations on the landscape. A 2016 study conducted extensive modeling with the goal of assessing quasi-extinction risk and aiding establishment of target population sizes. What this study found was that there was a high risk of extinction attributed to persistent decline and stochastic natural processes. Further evaluation on this topic revealed that a six hectare population goal would be capable of maintaining monarch populations on the landscape. This was determined after the Fish and Wildlife Service examined the, examined the results of this extensive modeling study and felt that the risk was abated in, asymptomatic, in an asymptomatic fashion at a six hectare level. Six hectares is roughly equivalent to the long-term mean abundance over the last two decades and about double of what is currently being observed in the field in monarch populations. Therefore, this six hectare number was adopted by the Fish and Wildlife Service and agreed upon by Canada, the USA, and Mexico. However, if the monarchs continue to decline, this number may change in the future with further evaluation of results. The conservation design portion of this strategic plan looked at how to develop models to identify habitat objectives and priority areas on the landscape. This eventually led to the all hands on deck study, which, will, which I will explain in further detail in a few slides. The spatially explicit models that were used by this group evaluated what components explained variation in annual population size. The conclusion was that, not surprisingly, to increase fecundity, we needed to increase nectar sources and milkweed availability on the landscape. The identification of habitat objectives and priority areas concluded that we needed 1.3 billion milkweed stems to maintain monarch populations on the landscape. Because that is not a small number of milkweed stems, the next conclusion was that we needed to return part of the landscape to milkweed habitat. But how would we go about doing that? The All Hands on Deck initiative, which is based on a 2017 study, looked at the decline of eastern monarchs, the connection to the loss of milkweed, and the steps that were necessary to amend the landscape scale habitat conversion across the Midwest. This study concluded that agricultural lands, protected areas, urban and suburban locations, right-of-way corridors, and other underutilized potential habitat could be converted to milkweed stems in order to offset the impacts to the monarch populations. That leads directly into the conservation delivery portion of the strategic plan. This focused very heavily on land transformation efforts. As I mentioned earlier, in order to put 1.3 billion stems of milkweed on the landscape, you need to convert some of that landscape back to just habitat for monarchs. The Mid-America Monarch Conservation Strategy and the right-of-way as, uh, right as Habitat Working Group banded together to form the Monarch Conservation Geographic Priorities, which are pictured in these two maps. These areas highlight the states and agencies and other, uh, other entities that banded together in order to identify specific points on the landscape that could be converted through that land transformation effort. <clears throat> The final portion of the strategic plan involved outcome-based monitoring. This is still an ongoing effort. The outcome-based monitoring asked, were the project assumptions correct and did the actions that were conducted achieve the intended results? 
Yes. In short, yes, they did. Because the land transformation efforts and the outcome-based monitoring pulled together a very large number of partners and collaborative efforts in, from USA, Canada, and Mexico. What we found was that co-production achieves more on the landscape. We cannot lean on only one entity in order to do the science or the monitoring. <clears throat> All of these efforts in turn led into the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program conducted under the, uh, the Monarch Joint Venture, which is a continental scale, randomized, multi-attribute monitoring effort that is pictured here in this map. At each of these locations, citizen scientists report back on monarch populations and habitat attributes. All of that information is used to contribute to the overall strategic plan, ongoing studies, and the uh, land management efforts going towards achieving uh, increased monarch populations. So just to recap this monarch conservation science partnership, the All Hands on Deck initiative motivated and assisted the Mid-America Monarch Conservation Strategy and the Canada Conservation Agreement with Assurance that is a joint venture of more than 45 energy and transmission companies and state DOTs, all focused on putting together and uh, transforming more monarch habitat on the landscape. Additionally, the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program is currently working with scientists and citizen scientists in order to collect more information on monarch habitat, all of which are going towards the, out the uh, uh, final outcome of increased monarch populations. <clears throat> Moving on to carnivore butterflies. <clears throat> the carnivore blue butterfly is a federally endangered butterfly that was listed in 1992. It is part of what we call the blues group of Lepidopterans. This small butterfly relies heavily on wild blue lupine or Lupinus perennis as a host plant. Its habitat is pine to oak barrens and savannas or basically open forest complexes on the landscape. These are early successional landscapes that are very highly dependent on disturbance. They reside on sandy nutrient poor soils <clears throat> of which wild blue lupine is very beneficial because it is a legume and it helps other plants grow in this very sandy nutrient poor ecosystem. Pictured here are several different examples of oak and pine barrens uh, habitat areas across the upper Midwest. As you can see here, it ranges from pine barrens and savannas to open shrubland to short grass prairie and even right of way corridors. The morphology of the Carner Blue involves a bivoltine life cycle. There are two flights per summer that are generally in sync with lupine life cycles. The species is also associated with ants. Ants are thought to protect the caterpillars in the pupa, while the caterpillars themselves secrete sugars and amino acids that provide food for the ants. The Carner Blues have a few predators and parasites, sort of run of the mill predators and parasites that generally prey on smaller insects, including spiders, wood ants, stink bugs, assassin bugs, dragonflies, uh, as well as uh, ichneumids and tachinid and brachnid wasps. The carnival blue butterfly ranges across the Great Lakes to the eastern seaboard. Uh, it is currently present in Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, New York, and New Hampshire. It is estimated to be extirpated from other states that are in the historical range, most recently Minnesota and Indiana, as well as Canada and Ontario specifically. The decrease in populations of the carnivore blue butterfly is primarily attributed to loss of habitat. And this loss of habitat is primarily attributed to forest succession in barrens and savannas because it is an early successional stage open forest complex and it can be very time consuming to maintain that open forest complex. There have been ongoing federal recovery and research efforts on the Carner Blue Butterfly since before it was listed in 1992. The federal recovery program itself, which is administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, was formed in 2003. <clears throat> Many federal, state, private, and public partners across the Great Lakes have banded together in order to form the federal recovery uh, uh, team and subsequent sub-teams. There are several subteams that conduct research on various subjects that are critical to the recovery of this species, including 
adaptive management with climate change, assisted migration, genetic diversity, and general habitat evaluations. This sub -team, or these subteams and the overall federal recovery team meet biannually or regular to, regularly for collaborative efforts. The Climate Adaptation and Vulnerability subteam was formed in 2014 in order to explore Carner Blue Butterfly vulnerabilities and best practices for climate change adaptation. Multiple agencies are collaborating. The overall effort is led by the Fish and Wildlife Service. However, USGS staff are contributing, uh, most recently me since I became a USGS member. Early work in the 1990s evaluated sun, shade, and habitat and resulted in management prescriptions that unfortunately are no longer proving to be strong enough in the face of climate change. Therefore, this subteam is building on those efforts and adjusting them as needed on the landscape. The subteam is focusing on Indiana Dunes National Lakes Shore as a case study. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, the Carner Blue Butterfly was present on the landscape at this particular site for quite a, quite a few decades and has recently been assumed to be extirpated from Indiana Dunes. At this site, we are evaluating site level challenges of managing an endangered taxa in a changing climate. The population has declined steadily since the 1990s despite consistent and well-tuned management on the landscape. Unfortunately, with the extirpation of the Carner Blue Butterfly, there also goes our case study, but we are continuing to look at these results to see how we can contribute, how we can transfer the information that we have collected from this site to additional sites in order to uh, prevent the extirpation from this species at any other new sites. This document, the Climate Adaptation and Vulnerability document is currently in a review. Habitat assessments are also being conducted both by subteams and at individual levels. Uh, Tammy Patterson, of, formerly of USGS, examined the synchrony between Carner Blue Butterflies and Wild Blue Lupine. If you remember earlier in the presentation, I mentioned that the Carner Blue has a bivoltine life cycle and two flights per summer that are normally in sync with the growth of Wild Blue Lupine. Tammy looked at, again, Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore and did field observation, uh, observations from 2012 until 2014 by looking at whether or not the Kerner eggs that were placed on the landscape were hatching at the same time or in, in good conditions with wild blue lupine. Unfortunately, during the study, a high mortality rate uh, was found for Carner Blue Butterfly eggs that were on sun exposed lupine, particularly during the 2012 drought year. However, the remainder of the study produced results indicating that for the most part, the lupine was senescing too early for the second flight of the Carner Blue Butterflies to have adequate forage. Further lab experiments conducted from 2011 to 2012 tested the sensitivity of Carner Blue eggs to different temperatures and ultimately found that the eggs are susceptible to temperature induced hatching, which we have also observed in the field during particularly hot springs. An ongoing population genetic study being conducted by Ralph Grandel of the USGS evaluated metapopulation groups. This is sequencing hundreds of different Carner Blue Butterfly samples from recovery states all across the Great Lakes region to the Eastern Seaboard. He's looking at how different the populations are from one metapopulation area to the next. So far, the study has found a high correspondence between physical distance and geographic distance. It has also found, using a structure analysis, a high degree of differentiation between representatives of the eastern and west regions of the subspecies, as well as among state collections. Here are a few graphs representing that genetic study that's being conducted by Ralph and his team. These are currently preliminary results, and I realize that they're a little difficult to see, but what you can interpret from these graphs is that these different populations are both genetically diverse and geographically di distant. It is particularly obvious in this graph where you can see these geographically distinct groups, which are also very genetically diverse one from the other.
That concludes my presentation for the day, um, highlighting different USGS recovery initiatives for both the Monarch and the Carner Blue Butterfly. I'd like to thank Wayne, Ralph, uh, Tammy, and Jill Utrup from the Fish and Wildlife Service for all of their help putting this together, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Fantastic, thank you so much, Anna. Um, and with that, we'd like to invite Anna to come off of mute and start her camera. And we'd like to invite you all, if you haven't yet, to type your questions into the Q&A box. So the first question that we have is, where's the best place to find information about host plants so that I can be sure to support Lepidoptera diversity in my pollinator planting? That's a good question. Um, you can uh, you can find quite a bit of that information online. Um, I have a very large series of field guides that I'm looking at on my bookshelf right now, which is where I generally look for that information. But there are websites online. I think one is actually called butterfliesandmods.org where you can find that information pretty easily just by putting in a common name of a butterfly and then it will list its host plant information for you and also give you a little overview of its life cycle. So um, generally speaking, I would go with the field guides because that has been peer reviewed and reviewed by an, ed by an editor um, and it would be a much more reputable information, but you can, you can certainly look that stuff up online as well. Fantastic, thank you. And what was that website again? I think, uh, you know, I can look it up for you after this and get back to you, but I think it's called butterfliesandmods.org and I used to use it quite a bit, but I'll double check and make sure that's what it's called. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, why did the carnivore butterfly become extirpated from the Indiana dunes despite management for them? And can you explain the sun exposure effect? They believe, well, we believe that the, uh, that climate change issues at Indiana, well, climate change issues overall uh, combined with microclimate issues at Indiana Dunes, which is based on sand and is a very, very hot area anyway, contributed to the extirpation of the carnivore butterfly. They think that the, the continual uh, decline of the carnivore blue was because um, the the larvae were getting baked in the spring and there was a high mortality rate. And when the adults were emerging during their second flight later in the summer, the lupine had senesced, which means it dries up. It had dried up too much to feed the larvae of the second flight. And that is something that we've seen in the field quite a bit. Um, oak savannas and pine barrens um, are based on sandy soil. So they tend to be pretty hot at a microclimate level during the day. So it's very important in these areas to provide shade or a heterogeneous um, you know, cover type across the landscape so that there are shaded areas and that there are open areas. And then you can have a different variety of places for these um, individuals to, to hide in. And the same goes for the butterflies and its host plant. In a heterogeneous environment, if you have shade provided, uh, the lupine will last a lot longer into the summer without drying up, even if it's really, really hot outside. And unfortunately at Indiana Dunes, despite the fact that they had shade cover, they still uh, did not have enough forage late into the summer for that second flight of Carner Blues. And so what happens is the first flight of the Carners is the result of the second flight laying eggs and surviving the winter. So they lay their eggs in August. Those have to make it through an entire winter and then they hatch the next spring around May or June. So the first flight tends to be small and then the second flight tends to be larger. Um, but if you disrupt any of that pattern, if it's too hot in the spring for the adults um, if, or, or for the larvae, or if it's too hot later in the summer and there's no forage, then you, you interrupt that population pattern. And they believe that's what happened there at Indiana Dunes. Those areas were very, very small and it was difficult to maintain those microclimates despite management. Oh, I'm sorry, what was the second half of the question? Oh, they were asking about the sun exposure? The sun exposure, yes. Okay, the, yeah, the sun exposure was pretty much what I just explained. That means that the, um, the places where they put the carner blue larvae on host plants out in the field were too hot and too dry and the larvae, the larvae didn't make it to uh, pupation and they didn't turn into adults. Yeah. 
it's very sad, I know. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, another person asks, um, she says that she's found a few uh, different sites, online sites that report uh, monarch sightings. And she wants to know if there is, if you can recommend a URL for a site that she can trust that incorporates accurate data. Oh, I would use Monarch Joint Venture. If you go to the Monarch Joint Venture website, they have the most well take, you know, well maintained website for for reporting monarchs, and that all goes into the national initiative uh, that's gathering information on monarchs and the habitat across the landscape. So. I would I would go with Monarch Joint Venture and um, and I uh, I'd have to go back and look at the slides again but there um, I listed the name for the specific initiative uh, here let me scroll down real quickly nope the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program which is housed under Monarch Joint Venture so that's what you should look for the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, we've been working on the recovery of the related, uh, Nab I hope I say this right, Nabokov blue on the yep. Ottawa National Forest uh, by planting plugs of the host plant to dwarf bilberry. Yep. Looking for a measure to tell when the experimental plant plantings are adequate. Do you have any suggestions? Um, is there a, a minimum patch size for Kerner Blues that might be relevant? And is there a, a minimum amount of nearby nectar plants that might be needed for adults as well? That's really great that you guys are doing that because Nabokov Blues are not all that common anymore. Um, actually, when I was in Minnesota, I looked into historical sightings of Nabokov Blues and they were scattered throughout the Superior National Forest, but they were no, we, we couldn't find them. As far as we know, they were no longer present on the landscape. But uh, generally, a, gui a general guideline for, um, for blue habitat like that are these smaller, these smaller butterflies that are not like monarchs, which migrate and are generalist species. These smaller butterflies tend to stay in their localized areas. So if you're dealing with a five acre plot or a one acre plot, you should try to have about 70% of it covered with scattered nectar plants. And the really important part about it is to have nectar plants throughout the entire flight season and not just focus on spring species or summer species, but have those late fall asters and goldenrods and other species as well. And as far as host plant, there isn't a specific number out there for that, but if you can have about 10% of your area covered in host plant, that is more than enough for a population of, of small butterflies. So the dwarf bilberry, if you wanna plant that back in the trees, um, which is where it normally likes to grow anyway, um, you know, uh, aim for about, you know, five to 10% of that habitat area, which could be a lot, you know, if you're looking at a five, per, at a five acre site, that, that is a lot of dwarf bilberry, but the more host plants you get in there mixed with those nectaring species that they can forage on, uh, the better results you'll have. And, and then again, like I said before, try to focus on that heterogeneous landscape, try to have a mix of, ha of, of shrubs and grasses and brush in that area so that you get these differences in microclimate during really, really hot summers. Those shrubs and that shade cover also provides protection during storm events. Um, so this is just a little side story, but the uh, butterfly population, the carnivore population that existed in um, Ontario, they were extirpated during one single storm event. So that is actually where the federal fish and wildlife population goals came from. There was estimated to be a population of about 1,500 butterflies there that were extirpated, extirpated during one single storm event. And then so the Fish and Wildlife Service doubled that. They like to double things for their goals. They did the same thing with the monarch population with the th three hectares is what you normally find in the wild and they made their goal six. So, uh, so now the population goal is 3,000 adults per area. And if that habitat area had had a more heterogeneous cover and provided more protection for the species, they might still be there. We don't know for sure, but we do know that those that mixed cover um, provides more protection for the species on the landscape, or especially in their small localized areas. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you, absolutely. Nope. Yeah, I, I don't think enough can be said about the importance of structural and vegetative diversity mm -hmm. for the conservation of, of so many species. Yep. Um, the next question is, when is it okay to clean up my garden so that I still allow refugia for overwintering invertebrates? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? It broke up just sure. a little tiny bit for me. Um, when is it okay to to clean up uh, my garden so that I still allow Bougia oh. for overwintering invertebrates? Well, what we suggest to people is that if you have like tall plants and you want to get rid of the stems or if you have leaves, you can cut them and just kind of lay them on the side of the garden until the next spring. And then into June, you can clean those things up and move them away. But there are butterflies and moths and bees and lots of other insects that utilize those dead stems and lay their eggs in them and they overwinter there. And uh, especially on um, a really, really common one is goldenrod. If you see these giant galls on a, on a goldenrod, there's actually an insect in there. And he's using that for a house over the winter. Um, so you can cut the thing, you can cut things down in your, in your garden. You can pile it together if you want to get your garden area cleaned up. That's fine. Just pile it someplace in your yard and don't burn it. Because if you pile it someplace, those insects can crawl back out again. But if you burn it, then they can't because you incinerated them. So, uh, so it's a good idea to just try to keep that brush um, in a pile or in place, or you can use it to mulch your garden over the over the winter. And uh, and so there's no real timing associated with that as long as you keep those those uh, those leaves and those stems um, in a place where those insects can crawl out the next spring. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Leave the leaves. Leave the leaves campaign. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, for about well, for one more question, one or two more questions. Um, one person, Jeff, is wondering if there are any uh, currently any uh, federal or uh, various state programs for landowners um, in Wisconsin, and I'll extend that to other states uh, that might help benefit uh, the corner blue or other species of concern. Oh, certainly. The, uh, the Wisconsin DNR actually uh, has the, uh, the Carner Blue Recovery Program that I, I used to work for, and you can still contact them. And if you want, you can actually get your, your property enrolled in the program as a recovery area, although it's a very complicated process. The easier thing to do is volunteer to count the butterflies that you have on your landscape um, or in your habitat areas and report them back to those state representatives. Uh, there are other federal and state programs that are basically like land landowners incentive programs for converting to prairie or converting to, um, you know, these, these grassland pollinator habitats. There's private agencies that do that as well. In fact, the Wildlife Society uh, has a landowner um, uh, program for converting your uh, uh, your yard into pollinator habitat. So they're out there. Um, and I can provide more information on that later after I uh, look up a few websites and make sure I have them correct. But, uh, but yep, they're out there if you want to get your, um, if you want to, you know, get your land, your habitat area or your yard involved in that and, and be recognized for it as well. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and somebody are... found the butterflies in mods.org. Oh, and wisconsinbutterflies.org is a really good website too. So you guys are finding it. It's great. Great. Thank you again so much, Anna. We really appreciate your presentation and responses to all the questions. Um, mm -hmm. And with the sake of time, um, we will move on to our next and final presentation. Oh, um, Actually, do I have time to answer that last question? Because I can sure, answer that. Sure, absolutely, yes, go for it. Okay, okay, real rapidly. Your last question about, I have five and a half acres of native pollinator plant and, I, and, they, and the US, USDA CRP suggested I burn a third every year. Yes, if you want to burn, if you think it is necessary to rehabilitate your habitat area, burn one third of it. That is absolutely correct because that leaves two thirds of your habitat untouched. And that means that the insects that are still residing in that area can repopulate the burned area the next year. And it's a really good guideline to go with, um, just one third of the habitat. So I hope that makes sense. But if you're dealing with a really, really small yard, then I would just suggest piling your leaves in, a, in the corner of your garden, leaving them. So thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, that's very important information to get out there. Um, again, we appreciate that so much. Um, and now with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce our next speakers, uh, Kelly Van Beek and Ben Walker. Uh, Kelly has worked as a wildlife biologist in public service for the past eight years. Her work encompasses managing habitat on public and private lands, 
engaging with the public regarding wildlife issues, and integrating ecological and social science at a large geographic scales for birds of conservation concern. Currently, her work is focused on non-game grassland conservation for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Migratory Program in the Midwest region. Ben Walker is a wildlife biologist based at the Glacial Ridge and Rydell National Wildlife Refuges in northwestern Minnesota. He serves as a field-based inventory and monitoring biologist um, uh, throughout the Midwest region. His work includes helping to manage both refuges while also working on, with other stations and partners on biological monitoring efforts, data and GIS analysis, and regional pilot projects. And with that, please welcome Kelly and Ben. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Van Beek, and today I am joined by my colleague, Ben Walker. We work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I work in the Migratory Bird Program, and Ben works in our re Refuges Program. And today we're going to talk about how we in our respective jobs have approached trying to maximize benefits for grassland wildlife on Fish and Wildlife Service lands in particular, especially for Ben, and then from my perspective as somebody who thinks at more of a regional scale, which would include Fish and Wildlife Service lands and other potentially private lands or uh, conservation lands. To give you an overview of uh, how our presentation uh, will flow, so like I said, I'm going to focus on how do we, um, how do I help develop and catalyze regional initiatives for grassland birds in particular, but while also incorporating the needs um, and objectives of other species, including people in our working landscapes that have grasslands in the upper Midwest. And then we'll pivot to Ben, um, who is involved in the day to day uh, refuge planning at a particular refuge in Minnesota and how they implement those plans uh, to benefit a variety of grassland wildlife. So I work with a partnership known as the Upper Mississippi Great Lakes Migratory Bird Joint Venture, which is a public-private partnership that is focused on uh, coming together to create habitat for migratory birds in the geography that you, seen, you see here outlined in black. A uh, very large geography here in the upper Midwest that this joint venture focuses on, a very diverse geography, uh, a very altered landscape um, based on the human footprint, and the joint venture uh, has an, a science arm that tries to develop products such as the one you see on the screen here um, that help us decide where we should work for certain suites of birds. And in this case, it's where do we have the most grass left um, in this geography that is contiguous to some extent and is situated in open landscapes. So we use tools like this to help us decide which parts of this large geography deserve focus uh, when we're trying to accomplish objectives for grassland birds. And as I continue to talk today, you'll see that uh, oftentimes we can accomplish objectives for a variety of other species in these landscapes as well. There are many decision support tools that we have available to us as conservation practitioners right now that try to help us strategize uh, where to focus. Again, I just showed you one of them through a, a joint venture planning document that I was a part of generating. Another tool that was recently developed in the past five years um, is another Fish and Wildlife Service um, backed product called the Gulf Hypoxia Conservation Blueprint. And this really tried to tie in multiple ecological benefits of projects in the Mississippi River watershed uh, that would ultimately help us um, address the Gulf Hypoxia problem. This snapshot is from Southwest Wisconsin, a landscape that I am very familiar with since I work in the Greater Madison area, at least my office is in the Greater Madison area. Um, we utilize a tool like this to help uh, reinforce to a variety of audiences that we are working in a, in a really critical landscape in Southwest Wisconsin to do things like reduce Gulf hypoxia, and we can also accomplish objectives for a variety of federal trust resources, as you'll see in a few minutes. The snapshot is from some work our colleagues in the Prairie Pothole Joint Venture have pulled together over the years, focusing on a grassland obligate bird species, the bobolink. Um, and there's a series of graphics here um, that at the top show where do we have um, highest modeled bobolink abundance in that joint venture. 
uh, and Ben is situated up in here in northwest Minnesota. Um, and you can see some little um, some little blips of hot spots of bobolinks there um, and the grasslands that are there. Uh, and when we when we oftentimes when we have when we generate models like this, what we like to do um, in order to consider benefits beyond a single species is overlay that information with other models we've developed. So um, and that could include uh, models that we've developed for waterfowl, which is what the center picture indicates, um, showing uh, where we have not just not only uh, high bobolink abundance, but modeled abundance, but also where do we uh, have priority areas for breeding waterfowl that also need um, some of those grassland habitats uh, to fulfill their nest, nest season requirements. And then the bottom graphic also shows information about some modeled grassland bird conservation areas, a, another a different product of some of our colleagues in the prairies um, to show where do we have the best opportunity for complexes of grasslands that could cover and provide habitat for a suite of grassland birds. So oftentimes we combine these large scale pieces of information uh, in order to help us decide, OK, which landscape should we be prioritizing in order to accomplish multiple objectives for a variety of species? In this case, it is about birds, but we oftentimes um, will leverage other information as well. To continue a little bit more on the um, on some tools that have been developed a little uh, specifically for bobolink, uh, this tool was developed when we were develop uh, when we wrote a um, bobolink uh, conservation strategy several years ago, trying to help us decide on a county level where might we have the best opportunities to uh, do conservation for bobolinks across their entire breeding geography. Again, you can see Northwest Minnesota looks like a great spot for us to be doing some of that work. Um, a graphic like this might not give you the best information at, um, for a local scale manager, but certainly, again, it can help us narrow in on um, certain parts of states, potentially even down to the county level, of where we have the best shot to conserve a species that's in steep decline like bobolink, and then hopefully uncover other opportunities as well for other grass and bird species, pollinators, um, plants, and then hopefully also accomplishing some objectives for uh, the folks that live and work on those lands. I believe this is my last slide about bobolink uh, to show you some more information that I've helped generate uh, as a regional biologist, regional migratory bird biologist. Again, trying to help us focus in on which areas of a bobolink range, and in particular in that joint venture geography that I showed in one of the first slides, which part of that joint venture um, should we be focusing in? On based on population trajectories of this particular species. So you can see some of uh, these bird conservation regions, which is the BCR, have you know, greater populations of bobolinks than others. Their um, potential population trajectories over time might be different. And so this helps us again focus in on, you know, where do we have the best, where do we have the most robust populations? And perhaps that's where we should focus potentially in this particular bird conservation region, in this case, bird conservation region 12. Um, or where do we have the ones that are suffering, you know, the steepest declines? Uh, we can uncover information like that and further focus in on specific geographies that could benefit a species like bobolink. I'm sort of taking high level information, you know, uh, you know, 10,000 foot scale information and then stepping it down um, as I go through these series of slides and then ultimately getting down to the local scale, which is what Ben's going to talk about. So I've talked about how do we prioritize you know, at pretty large geographies, whether that's um, across the breeding range of something like bobolink, stepping it down maybe even to a state or a county scale or a sub-regional scale like a bird conservation region. But what do we do when we actually get down? How do we prioritize um, quality and resilient grassland habitats when we get down to, um, you know, within that county scale? Um, we're talking now about really looking at somewhat parcel by parcel basis. Um, and a, and a framework that has been developed in the Midwest to help us prioritize and focus in on grassland landscapes that have uh, the most ability to conserve the most species is this grassland bird conservation area conceptual model. And this is specific really to our landscapes in the Midwest that have a lot of active row crop agriculture going on and recognizing that that agriculture will persist um, over time and is needed in order to create an open landscape that these birds um, 
can uh, persist in. So what we want to see ideally are these large core patches of permanent grass or potentially working grass as long as the, the structure of that grass is, um, is good for the birds that we're interested in. And that core of grasslands is then surrounded by row crop agriculture. It could be surrounded by um, CRP that kind of comes in and out of enrollment. It could be um, in a landscape with pasture, but overall we need these kind of relatively large 10,000 acre large landscapes um, with a good chunk of permanent grass that's in it and then um, a, a matrix surrounding it that is amenable to grassland birds. Focusing in even further in that grassland bird conservation area um, and thinking about the structure of the grasslands that we need in order to promote and conserve the suite of grassland species that I'm interested in. Um, we need all that we need a variety of structures is the long and short of uh, is the long and short of the message of this particular graphic, which um, has been provided by Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and some work that Dave Sample has done over the years. Um, so some species like short grass um, and some species like taller structure um, and relatively undisturbed structure. And there are a variety of species that like things in between. Um, and so in these grassland bird conservation areas, in these landscapes that are highly suitable for grassland birds, we need a variety of structure in those grassland patches in order to provide habitat for the entire suite of species that you see on this slide. And certainly folks like Ben are doing that and through their management regimes, thinking about um, what species are present on the property and, um, and recognizing that the variety of structures that grassland birds need caters very well to um, pro providing grassland habitat for things beyond birds, like pollinators, like particular plant species um, that are federally listed, like our grassland obligate mammals um, that are, might be a species of concern. I just want to quickly mention a place where all of these things have come together for us um, in the Midwest, where we're able to conserve, effectively conserve grassland birds while considering things like uh, pollinators that are known to be present in this landscape um, and we have the suitable habitat for them and could make significant progress towards um, either avoiding listing of some of these species or delisting them based on the populations that exist here, um, while also providing you know, a way for uh, humans that exist on this landscape to stay on their land as producers, as agricultural producers, stay in their local communities and uh, take part in, in um, the cultural heritage that is very strong in the southwest part of Wisconsin. And we got to working in that landscape through using a variety of regional and state tools um, that helped us focus in focus further down into that, into that south West Wisconsin pocket, and we can accomplish a variety of objectives for grass and wildlife there. I'll just quickly go through a couple examples of the of the wildlife that we know will benefit from our work in Southwest Wisconsin. Here's some work from our colleagues with um, at UW Madison um, using some Wisconsin uh, breeding bird Atlas II data, showing that you know indeed Southwest Wisconsin is a hot spot for eastern meadowlark. So if we want to do the most we can. Um, through strategizing for eastern meadowlarks in Wisconsin, southwest Wisconsin is the spot. We have a variety of pollinators that we are concerned about at the Fish and Wildlife Service, monarchs, uh, regal fritillaries, rusty patch bumblebee, um, and we know that these species are all present in that landscape. And therefore, it's even more important for us to be working in that landscape in particular because all of those habitat requirements for those pollinators overlap with the variety of structural needs of the suite of grasses bird species we're interested in. Here again, just another snapshot of where, um, where do we have a lot of occurrences of some of these species right there in Southwest Wisconsin in the case of real fritillaries. We also have a couple different uh, federally listed plant species in Southwest Wisconsin, meads milkweed, prairie bush clover um, are two examples where we know that we could improve uh, their population status by working in this area. And generally we're working in areas that we have previously picked for grassland birds uh, because the grassland birds need those larger landscapes, but along with it comes our ability to conserve a variety of other grassland species. And finally, of course, uh, not just to talk about non-game species, despite that's mostly what I focus on, but recognizing that um, there are other interests of folks in the state of Wisconsin and beyond, things like uh, ring-necked pheasants that um, 
do occur in, in places where we have resilient, um, healthy grasslands. And so again, we can accomplish objectives for um, bird watchers and folks that want to uh, pursue game species uh, by focusing in geographies where a lot of those habitat uh, conditions overlap. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben and Ben will further talk about how uh, the refuge system leverages their planning resources and their management tools to accomplish grassland habitat objectives for a variety of species. Thanks, Ben. Hey, thanks, Kelly. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Walker. I'm the refuge biologist at Glacier Ridge and Rydell National Wildlife Refuges, located up here in northwestern Minnesota. And we really wanted to kind of bring this down at the local scale and talk about uh, how we really kind of put this diverse prairie um, management into practice. So Glacier Ridge National Wildlife Refuge, it is the largest tall grass prairie and wetland restoration in the world. It was a partnership of over 30 different organizations and agencies uh, spearheaded by the Nature Conservancy. They donated the first tract of land in 2004 uh, to establish the refuge. So one of the really neat things about Glacier Ridge is of course the beach ridges. So these are long, linear, kind of gravelly, sandy ridges um, left over from Glacial Lake Agassiz. And so as the wave action kind of came up and along the shore, uh, they really created these unique formations. And the neat thing about these is they create some really diverse habitat. Uh, you can be in a relatively small area um, and look around and see a number of different prairie types, a um, number of different wetland types. Um, it's just a really, really kind of unique area. And so a lot of times we can get some really dry prairies up here along the slopes. We get in some easy prairies, some wet meadow prairie types down below, and then into these, some of these really unique wetlands. Um, and we have a number of fens across the refuge, and those fens support species like the Western Prairie for Jorkid. So Glacier Ridge is about 23,000 acres altogether that the Fish and Wildlife Service manages. About 6,000 of those acres are uh, remnant prairie. Uh, the rest are reconstructed prairie. And a number of decades ago, we kind of had this strategy shift. Um, you know, we were really looking at managing for single species, looking at dense nesting cover, um, planting a lot of that kind of throughout the air at the land we manage. Um, however, when the shift happened, we we're looking at, um, you know, more of species group management. You know, how can we provide for, for all these different species? Um, and that's really what happened on Glacier Ridge National Wildlife Refuge. So the, Na the Nature Conservancy, they combined off a lot of remnant prairies um, that, that they owned or uh, some of their partner lands had to get these really diverse seed mixes. Uh, these diverse seed mixes were planted out on the landscape and they really kind of connected the remnants that were that were um, initially there. And so what we have left is these large kind of contiguous blocks of diverse prairie habitat. And diverse prairie, we want this for a number of reasons. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is, is its resistance to invasive species. Then also its food and structure availability, um, even through kind of extreme climate events. Um, you know, when we have a diverse prairie, we'll have much longer kind of um, bloom seasons, um, especially if we have some cool seasons, some later seasons, you know, get into the fall, some of those New England asters are just beautiful. Um, and also structure as well. You know, if we're just managing for a single species and have, you know, a large stand of a big blue stem or something like that, um, we have to go in there and manually kind of manipulate uh, that area to try to get some of that, you know, um, some of that difference in structure. Um, whereas if, if we plant a very diverse prairie, um, you know, that structure is kind of already built in, that, that diversity is already kind of built in. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's really kind of a neat thing to see. Um, you know, it's one of those when you get on a, a really high quality remnant prairie, uh, just by looking at it, looking at the diversity, I mean, it, it just kind of, you know, just kind of hits you in the face. It's just, it's, it's just such a neat thing to see. Um, you know, and one of the most important things, of course, it supports a much higher level of biodiversity, anything from microbes to, to vertebrates. Uh, so this is kind of my diverse prairie roadmap. Um, you know, kind of how we operate when we pick up a new piece of land or we start managing on a, on a piece of land that's been idle for a long time. Um, so that's kind of this land acquisition area. And then we either kind of jump right into monitoring if some of the habitats, if the habitat's already intact and it already exists, or we'll jump into this reconstruction planning or looking, kind of taking an assessment. Um, you know, from there, there's different routes we can take. Um, if it was an old farm field or something, we'll kind of jump right into seeding. Um, you know, if we need to do any prep work uh, before the seeding, we'll definitely do that. Um, and then we just kind of follow this, this wheel of, of, you know, 
managing diverse prairie. Um, you know, we'll manage it, we'll monitor it, we'll kind of look back, take an assessment again, um, go back to management, monitoring, um, and then, you know, the same thing. If we, if we pick up a piece of land and we jump right into monitoring, um, you know, we can either jump down to, to management or, or really kind of take another look and see, you know, what we might be able to do, how we can improve that habitat. You know, because ultimately, we, you know, we're, we we want to manage for everything. Um, you know, we're we're always interested in some of these imperiled, um, you know, Lepidoptera, uh, you know, the monarchs, the skippers, the skipperlings. Um, there's so many other prairie obligate species um, that a diverse prairie can really support. You know, in addition to all the birds that um, you know we really care about, like the upland sandpiper, the Henslow sparrow. Um, you know, there's countless other prairie obligates. Um, you know, with having so many species. Um, you know, we really kind of have to scale it down. You know, we have to look at focal species because um, there are only six staff members on staff. Uh, we don't have unlimited resources. We don't have unlimited equipment or manpower. And so what we found in the Fish and Wildlife Service um, is, you know, we identify some resources of concern. Um, and how we do this, we work with our partners. We look at their priorities. We look at their population objectives. We look at our available land, what type of habitats they are, you know, how can we get the best return on our investment in this area? Um, from there, we'll pick a group of species that are relatively easy to monitor. Um, and then the neat thing about having these priority species is that we can then extrapolate down, extrapolate down. Um, we can look at these focal species, we know their habitat types, there's a lot of great research done on grassland birds, and so then we can start making those connections. Um, as far as other benefiting species. And we can really look at our pollinators. And so we might be out there doing bird counts, um, you know, trying to get an idea of our nesting blueing teal or, or our productivity of Western meadowlarks. But again, it's providing all this other information that, you know, we can use to say, yes, this is suitable habitat for um, a number of our imperiled pollinator species as well. Um, you know, by going out, taking a little bit of, of uh, monitoring data, this is a one site we just kind of recently acquired, um, we're running a transect through, um, then we can kind of create these, these habitat suitability maps um, where we can get a better idea of how our management might affect our focal species, which then in turn is gonna you know, affect all those other um, species that kind of fall under that umbrella. And so we can write up prescriptions, um, you know, looking at increasing native forbs, we can do some seeding actions, or if we need to reduce the litter, we can look at burning or reduce woody cover. Um, we can look at some different mowing actions. And so, you know, once we have these habitat suitability plans in place, then we can really start looking at um, prescription of actions. Um, anything from, you know, winter seeding. Uh, this action has been pretty common for us up in Northwestern Minnesota, um, just because kind of that late spring timeline, uh, we have personnel available, we have equipment available, and it's it's a great time to broadcast seed just because we start to see some of that freeze thaw cycle. That seed kind of gets locked into the snow and is pulled down into the soil versus a situation if we were to seed kind of later in the spring, get large rain events, some of that seed might be washed away. Um, or if we try to drill, a lot of times our ground's frozen for a long time up here. Uh, so this is kind of a great um, tool that, that we've been kind of using the last decade or so. Or if we need to prescribe some different mowing actions, uh, we can go out there, remove some trees, remove some woody cover, you know, if, if historically these areas were, were more open prairie um, and try to connect some of those larger kind of contiguous grasslands. And of course, fire. Fire is by far probably our biggest tool. Um, like I said, we only have about six people on staff. We're managing about 23,000 acres on Glacial Ridge. Um, and so we have very large fire units. Um, it's by far the, the best way to, to beat back some encroaching brush into some of our high priority grasslands or reduce some of this litter, um, you know, kind of create some, some different habitat structure. Now, the one thing with fire, we're always worried about refugia. You know, how can are we, you know, how can we put kind of best management practices in place to ensure that, um, you know, we're not damaging one species group uh, while we're trying to benefit another. And so one thing we try to do is we try to mix it up. You know, we try to create kind of diverse settings, diverse situations. We burn at different timings. Um, and, you know, looking at, this is just a map of some of our burn priorities. Um, and just for an example, if you were to combine, you know, spring burn priority two, eight, and six, this is about a 6,000 acre unit. Uh, so trying to go in there and um, manually put refugia in, it's, it's, it's kind of hard, um, but we can use the wetlands that are there, 
the, 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 the framework of, of how this landscape's kind of put together. Um, and then we'll also add some cows in, which I'll show you a picture here in a second. Um, but one thing I really wanna show you is, you know, remember all those different ridges, we talked about wetlands. Um, I just wanna show you how much of Glacier Ridge National Wildlife Refuge is actually wetlands. So I'm gonna add another layer here just to kind of give you an idea. So all these brown layers are classified wetlands on Glacier Ridge. And I'll just cycle back and forth to give you a good idea. So the neat thing about that is a lot of these wetlands kind of act as fire, fire shields. You know, we combine that with some grazing um, that we have uh, going on the refuge. We have about 7,000 acres um, currently fenced in for grazing. And we can create kind of refugia, you know, on a very large scale, um, which is pretty neat to see across the refuge. Um, and, you know, this, this, you know, we feel a little bit better about moving along uh, that, you know, we're, we're not having that kind of scorched earth, you know, high intensity prescribed fire. Um, it's going to be one where, you know, these, these fires, they, they kind of finger out, they go into different areas, you know, we kind of let them, you know, do their own thing, which is probably how it was done, you know, more naturally, um, you know, back in the day, there was just, just kind of a lot more diversity um, and how this all kind of gets put together. Uh, it's pretty neat to see uh, out on the refuge. So that's just kind of a, you know, some, some different things that we're doing on the refuge um, to kind of bring it all back around. Um, you know, really the Fish and Wildlife Service, we're, we're trying to work in the highest priority landscapes. Um, you know, working with the habitat, making it as diverse as possible, it really accomplishes multiple objectives. Um, and again, you know, we don't have unlimited personnel, we don't have unlimited resources, and so that's really the best way forward for us. You know, and, and really our overarching goal is to build a resilient grassland landscape um, you know, that's going to be our, our, our best path forward, um, you know, as we face some of these major threats as climate change and different invasive species. So uh, with that, Kelly and I would be happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Um, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone today. Thank you so much, Kelly and Ben. Um, and with that, we'd like to start our Q&A session. If you haven't done so already, please do uh, type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, so the first question we have is, when planning a restoration for grassland dependent species, including residential and migrating birds, what elements are most important to consider and include? You wanna take a stab at that one first, Ben? Um, I, I can answer as well, but given that you do the active management these days. Sure, sure. Um, you know, one, one thing, um, I, I think you try to go as diverse as you, you possibly can. Um, you know, with a lot of our grassland birds, it's really gonna kind of depend on size. Um, and as far as, you know, what, what birds they may attract or, or may not. Um, so with whatever you're working with, um, you know, I think if you, if you try to look for that diversity, not just plant species, but also that structure diversity, um, you know, that's going to kind of be your, your best bet. I've seen, you know, a lot of bobolinks use relatively small areas that are just, you know, recently mowed or shorter, hens little sparrows, um, you know, typically wouldn't use those kind of areas because they're looking for a lot larger areas. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I think with that, whatever you're working with, um, you know, diversity with species and structure, you're going to kind of get your, your best bang for your buck there. I think I mentioned um, in my part of the talk as well, and I'll just reiterate it again, that for the most part for our obligate grassland birds, it's really about the structure of the grass. Um, and so if we're trying to manage for both those obligate grassland birds and the pollinators, um, then we definitely should be thinking about plant diversity given the needs of those pollinator species. The birds can kind of, you can kind of get away with not having um, as many diverse forb species, for example, they're really honing in on the structure, which is why we've seen our grassland birds do well in some of those non-native cool season plantings that we historically had um, a lot of producers using for their hay crops and things like that. So structure is certainly important. And yes, the size of the patches and then the landscape that those grassland patches fall in are really critical in order for us to um, have the grassland bird communities that we would like to see. And when you're describing the patches, um, can you go into a little more detail in terms of what you've, in terms of what you're, you're describing, patch size and 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 shape and it's it's variable um, and and the, so there's no silver bullet answer. Um, every lots of people always say, well, if, you know, should it be 40 acres? Should it be 20 acres? And I give the classic scientific answer of it. Really, it honestly depends. Um, what what part of the, your range you're in for that species? Um, for example. 
in areas that have a lot of topography, like the Southern Driftless Grasslands, like I mentioned, um, we can get away with somewhat smaller sites because we get that heterogeneous structure in a smaller footprint on the landscape just because of the topography. Whereas if you are in a really big, a really flat landscape where the horizon is very open and those birds can see a long ways, um, how they interact with that landscape, how they, I don't mean to anthropomorphize them, but how they feel about the openness of it changes. Um, and so we've, we've done a lot of analyses, not me personally, we being the bird conservation community, have done many analyses over the years about um, what landscapes, what, la what should the landscape look like? How prescriptive can we be? What size do they need to be? Those patches need to be, and it just, it varies depending on what's in the matrix and it varies depending on the bird community that exists there. Um, you know, the, the smaller five acre pollinator plantings that we're kind of seeing pop up around, um, you know, let's say close to a homestead or something, probably not the, you know, gonna provide a robust habitat for grassland birds unless there's a whole bunch of other grass and open landscape component nearby. But, um, you know, once you get into that 10, 20 acres, you're going to start picking some of them up, certainly when you get into the 40 acre range, as long as it's not a super isolated patch of grass and it has the appropriate structure, you can get some of those species like a Henslow sparrow, um, like a bobolink, um, but it really depends on where you're at in that species range. And one thing too, I mean, even, even if you have some of these smaller plantings, I mean, just from a, from a food perspective, um, you know, we have, I have little tiny prairie plantings in my yard and um, we get a great diversity of birds migrating through, just picking off the seeds, using it, you know, we usually typically kind of put these plantings around our feeders, um, you know, just, just from that kind of enjoyable aspect, um, you know, they're, they, they do great, you know, um, they, they're able to attract a lot of different birds, so. Yeah, but it makes a good point. A lot of what I'm describing is breeding season cover. We, are, we honestly know very little about what these birds need during their migration period, um, at least in the in the U.S. and and potentially on the wintering grounds as well. So um, we just don't have a lot of good answers about um, how frequently they're using, you know, some of those smaller sites. How frequently they're using agricultural areas is just not the it's the information we're trying to gain right now through some of the new tracking technologies. Fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, in parallel with that, uh, Ruth has asked, is there a publication link that lists bird species and general habitat needs and actions that need to be taken in restorations? Yeah, there's actually a great publication um, from uh, Northern Prairie Wildlife Research um, Center um, that basically goes through a lot of the high priority grass and birds. Um, it basically does a literature review on all the habitat requirements. Um, so that's something I could, we could send you the, the link, Elizabeth, and if you can get out to the participants. Absolutely. I think we'll, we will send out an email to all the registrants and participants. Uh, we will include a link to the recording of this workshop, as well as uh, links to the various resources that our, our speakers have provided. Okay, um, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, Let's see, oh, it just jumped, sorry. Okay, it seems that many people raise bobwhite quail and release them, but to little effect on the abundance of cobays. Uh, why does raising and releasing quail seem to have diminished returns? Uh, I don't claim to be any sort of game species expert, but um, what, I, what I can say is that, especially in the Northern part, the northern fringe of the bobwhite range where potentially we have been releasing quail, although they do it in the eastern U.S. as well, and New Jersey had relocated some bobwhites to try to reestablish their populations. Um, for a lot of the times, the birds that we are seeing on the landscape in a place like Wisconsin where I live um, are just artifacts of people using them for dog training purposes or something like that, and maybe they persist for a couple of years. And so um, we're not specifically trying to stock them, I guess, to bolster their populations. It's the same with um, Rignick pheasants in Wisconsin, really the, the, the effort of stocking is, is an attempt to provide a hunting opportunity and not to try to, um, not to try to reestablish those populations. Uh, it, it comes down to habitat, truly, just like any of the other critters we're talking about. Uh, bobwhite quail need a variety of different structure and habitat across their full life cycle during a year. And a lot of the, a lot of those components just don't exist in our landscape anymore with a much more um, monotypic looking agricultural settings. So whether that's the brushy fence rows adjacent to the grassland habitat they need, um, 
whether it's more pesticides being applied to our agricultural areas and reducing insect populations that those birds need, all those factors come together to, as to why we've lost bob whites in some parts of their range and why it's really difficult for us to get them back. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not totally aware of all the state's efforts in their in the bob white range about um, trying to reintroduce their populations, but certainly the national bob white. Um, uh, I'm going to mess up their initiative name, but the national uh, bob whites have a, a national initiative across their range and in certain parts of their range, they they are very successful at honing in on areas of the areas of a landscape that would be most beneficial to do the habitat work that we know how to do for bob whites, um, and and. They have a variety of uh, modeling uh, products that they've put out there to help us guide, to help guide us to where those areas might be, where maybe maybe reintroducing populations uh, would be a worthwhile expense. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, um, this pretty much concludes our first workshop session. Um, again, I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to Ed Spivak, Anna Hess, Kelly Van Beek, and Ben Walker for their informative presentations, and to thank all of you for your participation. Again, the recording of this workshop will be available to you in approximately one week. And please join us next week uh, for the next workshop, Bridging Scientific Research to Applied Management Practices, that'll take place on Wednesday, November 10th. Thank you all again so much, and have a wonderful rest of your day.